bittersweet. Bittersweet, bittersweet. Tracy Lee, so happy to have you here. And I see you at Lord Town. Is that Lord Town about to set up over there? This is our uh, 566 show. And uh, half of all the gigs we've ever played are actually have been here. And there were bikers everywhere, and it was just, it was the most rocking scene. I, had, I was from Southern California, and I had never seen a street rocking like this. It's one of the reasons I decided to stay in Arizona, because Mill Avenue was so fun. Perry's was the one. I walked into that place, and there was a rock and roll band playing. They used to have 25 cent Cuervo Gold night. 25 cent shots of Cuervo Gold. I'd never seen people that drunk before. And uh, Perry's was this huge, you know, old uh, territorial bar with, the, with the, the copper ceilings. And At the time, there was a, just a lot of mom and pop stores up and down the street. And Mill Avenue had more of a um, bohemian, hippie kind of uh, 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 atmosphere. So there's a lot of different folks walking around. It was like a, um, a better version, a more thriving and, and surviving version of like Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, but, but not as controversial. It was, it was still you know, a college town that, that kept its eye on the ball. Coming down here when I was in college and on a date or with my friends, it had a different feel. It was very homegrown. And there would be a fight in there every night, and the guy that that ran the place, I think he was in a wheelchair, I'm not sure, but he was always sitting down behind the counter. And uh, every time there was a fight, this guy would pull out his gun and shoot it off to stop everything. And sure enough, there were like 50 gunshots, holes in the ceiling. And when it would rain, it would rain right down on this guy because he had all these holes in the ceiling for his gun. But it was a really fun place for the college kids and, and the bands to play. Well, I opened my office in uh, 1973. I moved, uh, moved to Mill, I think, around 74, 75, and I've been down here ever since. Mill Avenue at that time was, uh, was technically a highway. It was the US 60 that uh, turned into Apache. So as a result, there were a lot of highway-oriented businesses down here gas stations, motels, there was a radiator shop, you know, restaurants that would cater to people passing through. And then there was another club that was a real hippie kind of black light painted 60s kind of thing called the Asylum. And that's where all the real strange bands play. And then just past that at the Casa Loma Hotel, they had the Casa Loma Lounge, which had been sprayed with foam to make it look like a cave. And they called it the cave, and it really looked like a cave. You went in there and it, it, it felt like you were underground. That place was the wildest 
place on Mill Avenue for the college kids, the cave. It looked pretty grim from uh, from my perspective as as an architect who wanted to uh, be in a in a really pleasant environment. Uh, but at the same time, there were the beginnings of uh, cultural change. The uh, you know counterculture movement uh, was here. There were a number of uh, restaurants, head shops. We were all a bunch of long hair types back in those days. Can remember Circus, which was uh, kind of a gift shop, chocolate and drug paraphernalia place. <laughs> My dad started Harkins Theaters on Mill Avenue here with the Valley Art. My dad was playing a gig out in Mesa, played violin, sang, uh, called Einstein the Eight Adams. My dad, I guess, was Einstein. And the landowner of the State Theater, whose tenant just left, went broke, went out of business, uh, approached my dad and said, hey, you're a showman, you're on stage, you have your own homemade PA system. He said, why don't you open this theater up? With your sense of showmanship, you're probably a good theater operator. And I got my dad started in the theater business. I mean, it used to be, a, a, it used to be a, the Golden Temple restaurant, and so there's a lot of Sikhs that were on Mill Avenue. And the characters, uh, being able to kind of like just play music out on the street, work with the audience, or try to capture an audience when people are moving by, and then they stop and listen to you for a while, then you know how to engage, engage them into your music, so. The uh, Golden Temple restaurant, Armadillo Waxworks, mom and pop diner type restaurants, Changing Hands Bookstore was just getting started in the early 70s. It, it had the beginnings of counterculture, and, uh, but at the same time, uh, the highway-oriented businesses were still active down here. It was interesting. And 60s were on the other side of the street, up towards University more. It was going back when Perry's was going. And Long Wong's didn't start until, I think, the mid-70s or something. The art festivals, they, they had a real nice mixture of uh, artists and then a nice mixture of, uh, of music. And the music, uh, there was a lot more music in it at the time. And then Chewy's became a rock and roll nightclub there. And it was right on Mill and it was right in where the cave had been. And they, they took all that cave stuff off and made it into a building. Streets blocked off, people coming out to see the, the bands play. Um, it was just, it was just, it was nice. And they moved Chewy's to an upstairs location. People just hated that place, but they had a lot of big concerts in there. And right across the, from Hayden Square was that other place that had live music, Balboa Club. That, they had a lot of live music in there. Well, I don't think any of us were in any danger of making our living playing on Mill Avenue, but it sure was a lot of fun knowing that I could go you know, three blocks down and play Gibsons or... You could see you know, nine bands it, in one night. It was yeah. cooler to play and then run and go see somebody. We used to go, it was cool because remember we used to go play at Wong's and they had that liquor thing you couldn't for drink. a while. You couldn't, you drink, couldn't drink, but we just run right over to Six East between sets. And boy, did it smell bad yeah. when you were waiting to get in. <laughs> it did. There's all these fucking low lives and scumbags and... But you miss it. That I love. Sinky hippies that I just love. So those days like that were uh, some of my fondest memories. If you weren't rolling tape, I'll tell you some other stuff. <laughs> I was conceived right up there. My mom and dad lived in this apartment upstairs, and, and my mom, after a couple years of marriage, she gets pregnant with me. Right up there where that ceiling is, there was a bedroom for my parents. I was potty trained in that bathroom. And some employees around here, they have a nickname. They call it, they call it Point Conception, where they think Mr. Harkins was, was conceived. When you, when you say Mill Avenue, you're saying kind of a lot. If you, right. you know, yeah. if, you, if you came up during that era, and you were, especially if you were in a band, it doesn't matter if you were in a band or not, if you were going out and seeing bands, the Mill Avenue thing had like a proximity of about a mile and a half or two miles. And it all meant, you know, I mean, originally, about. the Sun Club was part of that, you know. I owned the Sun Club for about a year and a half. And uh, I had been playing there since for uh, 20 years. And I finally bought it because it was falling down, and I thought somebody should try to save it. The roof was falling in, the walls were falling in, it was pretty sad. So I bought it and named it the Sun Club, and uh, we were pretty successful, but I was just a horrible businessman. I had uh, blues and jazz and country and that kind of thing, and then I realized I lived 100 yards from the 
from the uh, college, so I thought, let me try some uh, alternative rock, which I didn't know anything about that music. And so all, all these, those kids were hanging out in there, listening to the blues, the bands, the guys. And they kept saying, why don't you put some music in here from our bands? So then once I got those guys to play and the guys that were hanging out in there, then uh, that's when all the kids followed and the place got packed. When we were young, there was great bands coming out of here, you know, so it was cool to hang out and see interesting, cool new things, you know. And if it went over, that was great, you know. And if not, you still played out and you still worked it and you still milked gigs and shit, you know. And we warmed each other up and we never gave a shit about that, you know, who was headlining or whatever. The town has always been really good to us. And when it was really good, it was Mill Avenue and everybody hooked us up with shows and we helped each other out and we lent gear and made things happen, you know. It was important to us to, to make a scene great. And there was lines around the building all night long. It was the biggest crowd we had ever had for this unknown band. And then I realized that, you know, this is what the kids want. So I had alternative rock only on Wednesdays to pay for the Big Pete Pearson and the blues bands on Saturday. <laughs> And then when the guys bought it from me, they said, well, we can see by your books that this is the thing that makes money. And during the, the transition, they asked me who would be the band you would, you would spotlight the most, and I told them the Gin Blossoms. <laughs> Rockaway Records. How's it going? This is Robin. How are you, Mary? I like ACDC. This is a good record, you know. I understand you got an album coming out. Our album will be out in like three weeks from now anyway. Thank God. And it's called... It's called Songs for a Mormon Child. Our record's called Dusted. Dusted. Dusted's an alright title. A jazz section for cassettes? All I really want to be able to do is... is... make records like songs for a Mormon child and go on tour and buy a van and stuff like that. That's all I really want to get out of this thing, so. I don't have a specific favorite memory of Mill Avenue. I just remember, you know, lots of cool moments that sort of defined it for me. You know, the, the band being on stage inside Long Wongs and me just being right outside the door talking to Elvis Del Monte and my girlfriend and just people going by. Hey, the Jim Blossoms are playing in there. Jim Blossoms, you should go check that out. That, uh, that's one moment that jumps out at me. Um, once there was this really drunk guy and I used him as a mic stand. I made him stand there and be my mic stand. And that was, that was really funny. It seemed to me that every single person in the bar was laughing and a part of that. And there's mostly just a lot of special little moments like that. It was important hooking up young bands and finding new talent. Hard rock or southwestern pop, from pups to blossoms to revenants to JFA. You know, there's a lot of shit coming out of here. We didn't know we were hot or think it was hot or like counted on like the meat puppets or any of these bands like getting us famous or shit. We played. There was so much to choose from, it was almost hard. You had to schedule your night. And I would literally have an agenda. At seven o'clock, you know, I'm gonna show up for loaded. And then Dud I would play early and then we would all go over and see Curious Walk, you know? and then Major Lingo might be playing over at the other bar, you know? So you could see like five things in different genres all night, you know? And we were fortunate to have nightclubs that were centrally located, that felt like a part of our scene and nurtured what we were doing. And we would travel outside of our town. You couldn't believe that people were, wouldn't like lend you a snare drum if your shit broke or, or a, an amp or something. You know, to us it was like, you know, hey dude, I. Do you have a, an entire kit I can borrow?
with something and I mean I, the, the weirdest thing was they started uh, renovating the city just those uh, buildings on the street and they, they wanted to make make them look modern and the city finally decided after a while that it was just too ugly and they wanted to make it look like it used to look and they renovated it again and, and they they tried to make it look like it did before they had ruined it the first time. It was one by one, we were watching things just kind of disappear, you know. Edsel's Attic, Armadillo Waxworks, Moon's Cafe, Circus, Chewy's, Nightclub, Cookies from Home, McDonald's, <laughs> but I don't miss that. Tony's Italian Food, Desert Flower Cafe, it affected the, uh, the flow. I miss the old days of, of going to um, you know, the health food restaurants that used to be here on Fifth Street and Mill, and, and then seeing merchants leave, like Changing Hand Bookstore and, and some of the smaller restaurants be replaced by, you know, larger chains. It, it bothers me. The, the bottom line is those, all those places that were down on Mill Avenue, they're all gone, and it sucks. Yeah, and I don't think, I don't think the people really requested that. You know, in the early 80s, uh, those of us who were in, involved in, uh, in the planning process, uh, I think the majority of people felt that it was a good thing to have a, a blend. True mom and pops or their businesses that have a few stores uh, and, and still offer a great deal of, of uniqueness. As long as it was, uh, there was a good balance between those and the independent businesses, and as long as the chains were generally the kind that, that had some uniqueness to it. And then shortly thereafter, uh, the uh, hotel, the Mission Palms Hotel, opened up. And I remember walking down the street one day and looking up and seeing, for the first time, a woman in high heel shoes. And I, I thought, this place has finally changed. Uh, it, it brought really a, a whole new interest, a whole new subculture, you might say, into the downtown. Well, I guess the subculture would be the, uh, uh, the business community, uh, which hadn't previously made itself, revealed itself uh, to, to uh, our little district. There was a, there was a lot of um, uh, uh, changes when some of the uh, more corporate uh, entities started moving in on the block. Uh, a lot of things happened, and the people that didn't, the, the original merchants, who didn't own the buildings, um, were starting to relocate. Well, I went to college in Tucson, so I'd come up to Mill and see, well, the art, the life that was, that was there. I, could, I, I didn't walk anywhere without a camera. I, I, would go, I would walk through there and my mind would just explode. like Shakespeare scenes, you know, right there on Mill, just walk by and they were just reenacting scenes. back in 2000, I went straight into Tempe, you know, and was looking for it and it was gone. The scene, the artist, everybody I was looking for was gone. It's just Starbucks and Gap and, you know, no longer the, you know, guy with the guitar. Yeah, there was just this really cool energy of artists and it just, I don't know when exactly. I mean, last time I saw it was probably like 97, 98. It's like somebody came in with a pressure washer and sprayed everybody away and now it's just, <clears throat> price of property went up. We were out in the cattle ranch, 
working on a cattle ranch and uh, playing bluegrass music. And we decided to come back to Phoenix and do the honky tonk thing. So we're here about every weekend anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so we put our honky tonk rockabilly thing back together and uh, playing around, started getting a good following, and uh, all the bars started closing. We lost all the good bars, all the dive bars, all the good drinking bars playing, listening to music bars. They paid Paradise and put it in the parking lot. So we went out to Austin and had to leave Arizona for the fact that they just don't want to support the music. Which is just shocking to me that we can live in a city that at one point had the potential of being Austin. To have that and to blow it to, the, to this extreme just blows my mind. A lot of times I think that the people in power go, well, why aren't these music places as successful as the music places used to be? To them, you know, I don't know if I should name names, but the current places where they're trying to have live music are run by people who want to sell alcohol. They're not music people. So for those of us who are going to shows, we know that the room is too tinny. We know that it hurts to have amplified music. We know that's your bartender trying to run the soundboard. Well, anytime you replace a handmade nightclub that was built by locals and frequented by locals, and you replace that with a with a neon corporate structure, you're you're losing something special and rare, and something that makes it a part of our hometown. Music people know when they go to these, and that's why they don't go. That's why these places have crappy bands, and why there's no one in the audience. And the ones who are in the audience are screaming at each other and not having a nice experience at all. So you can't just substitute a funky old stinky place like the Sun Club used to be, or you know any of those places that used to be successful down on Mill Avenue, for shiny new bars that look better and just expect that people will go. It doesn't work that way. Boy, that's, that's what's kind of the saddest about the whole thing with not only the bars, but the, the, the bookstores and the local mom and pop vibe that See, kind of- there's no mom and pop anymore. And I don't know, and I don't think it was Tempe as a whole that kind of turned its back on it. The worst one was the Changing Hands bookstore was the mom and pop coolest thing on Mill Avenue. It was just so cool, people loved that place. And I'd say that was the death of it. That was like the last one when they moved out. I said, that's it. One of the turning points for the whole atmosphere of the street for me happened when Changing Hands Bookstore finally closed and they moved off of Mill Avenue. I opened my store in 1974, tiny location on 5th Street in downtown Tempe. I wanted to be near the university and I felt like my store was really about um, being a cutting edge community cultural environment. It was very difficult to move from the urban downtown Mill Avenue store that we had to the suburbs. I swore I would never have a bookstore in the suburbs, and now here I am living testament to a bookstore in the suburbs. Well, I think over the decade of the 90s, the, the end of those kinds of businesses should have been well understood because of the kinds of things that took place in the 90s. Real estate investment trusts were making substantial investments in downtown real estate, and they were driven primarily by the guarantees of large corporate leases. And by setting a standard where large investments were made that were driven by that kind of corporate uh, notion, uh, the strip mall or, or large mall uh, retailer, one could have understood early on, as I did and, and spoke about uh, during the 90s, that we would lose potentially the mom and pop businesses that made up the environment of Mill, Mill Avenue. Developers suddenly um, discovered us and decided that if these stores were doing so well and they were such a huge destination and draw for people from all over the valley that they wanted a piece of the action. And so rather than integrate themselves in some gentle, appropriate way, they instead went to the city mothers and fathers and started buying up properties and um, convincing the um, redevelopment department as well as the city council 
that they had a little gold mine in downtown Tempe and that what they should do is exploit it. When you start exploiting something that exists, that's working, then that's exactly what you get, which is exploitation and ultimately demise. Um, in the last year, I've written a series of articles on development in downtown Tempe and also corporatization and development at ASU. In like the 1950s through 1970s, Mill Avenue was kind of just a place where families that lived in the neighborhood would go to like, buy their hardware. There was a sporting goods shop, a grocery store, and ASU existed in the same general neighborhood, but kind of down the street separately from it. Um, in the past five or six years, the two have really started to feed off of each other in pretty noticeable ways. Michael Crow came, the Board of Regents, Ira Fulton, to expand the university as much as possible. The Brickyard Building, corporate money, private funding, the university has spread what he calls the New American University. <laughs> Michael Crow came here in 2002 after Laddie Kaur, who was the former president, retired. The Board of Regents wanted to bring kind of more of a go-getter, someone who would energize the university a little bit more. So they sought Michael Crow out from Columbia University. In his inaugural speech, he um, outlined his plan for what he calls the New American University. Trying to figure out what the New American University actually means is difficult to say the least. Crow's plan as part of his New American University was to bring as much private or corporate money to the university so that ASU wouldn't be so dependent on the legislature. You can really see how the university has spread out of its boundaries kind of into the boundaries of the city's downtown. We became two successful developers. Renovations, the rents skyrocketed. There were new properties built that were not in scale to the ones that were already there. Many of the small businesses went to renew their leases they could not renew them at a price that they could afford to stay in business. The role of a university, and specifically a state-funded university, is to create what's called a public trust, which means citizens go there to educate themselves, to learn how to become independent thinkers, and then go out in the world and share what they've learned. The problem with ASU is that it's become beholden to its corporate sponsorship, Boeing, Bristol Myers Squibb, so the university is no longer answering to the citizens of Arizona or to its students. Um, the university and its president are now answering to their funders, both private and corporate. It's also a little bit dangerous. If you're researching a new cancer drug and you're researching it for Bristol Myers and they've told you that they want a specific outcome, um, it's going to be hard to hang on to your academic and research integrity unique businesses, the unique you know, music venues, the unique restaurants were, were going away. When the block gets taken up by, um, it, gets, it gets reshaped, different architecture, uh, layout, I think some people find that very appealing, but there's something that you lose. Character was lost when you don't have the chipped up, cracked up sidewalk, the little planter that was sitting outside of the window and the hand painted sign on the window. The, the atmosphere that's created by the look, you know, it's a whole different set. And there's also a shift in culture. Um, um, you don't have, you didn't have the feeling that there was much individual creativity. It's gentrification in its own way. I mean, you know, the artists were there in the beginning before Tempe or ASU had spread out and became a place for the corporate um, stores. And, you know, once they had made a scene there, I guess, and they threw them all out and put up their stores. And I guess what's wrong with it is we're losing our, our it's cliche to say it, but it, like we're losing part of our soul. We're, you know, what made it cool isn't there anymore. We just ended up fighting for a long time and then finally deciding that enough was enough. If someone really wanted to understand what I'm trying to say, go to Mexico or other countries and just walk down the street and look how there's so many different things, so many different colors, so many different styles of architecture that are right next to each other. You come here and everybody wants to lay out a plan that looks almost similar, just shade different, but not really. And it makes them happy. It doesn't work for me. What works for me is variety, difference, 
One shop expresses this owner, this shop expresses that owner. They could have let all that development happen in other places and left Mill Avenue as the jewel. And, and it'd be funky and cool and then have all that corporate stuff around it, they'd still make money. I mean, we can still play and stuff and that's fine, but but it, you know, it just ain't the same, man. It changed it all. You they know, cut the heart out. <laughs> Stay really what you're looking for. I'm looking for money. I'm looking for money. I'm looking for money, but I can't find out nowhere. Staggering with it, where did he go? Is that him digging in a hole? Up drove to me in a big black car. Staggering with it, what you looking for? I'm looking for money. I'm looking for money. I'm looking for money, but I can't find out nowhere. Guitar solo. That's it. Right. <laughs> I get profit and loss and wanting to, you know, progress and whatever, but you know, there's a, I guess it's art versus commerce. What's really being lost more than anything else is a sense of place, um, a feeling that you are in Tempe, Arizona when you walk down the street. Um, you walk down U Street in Washington, D.C., for example, and you know that you're on U Street in Washington, D.C. There are things there to indicate that you're in a place that's not like any place else in the country. This is where Ben's Chili Bowl is. It's a restaurant that's been there forever. And it just happens to be right across the street from a brand new development, but they've been able to coexist. Same thing with walking around um, the Lower East Side in, in New York or Coney Island in New York. The, the day I snapped, I think this woman was talking about how great Chicago was. And I said, oh, how long have you lived here, you know? And I was thinking she was going to say three months, and she said 16 years. No one ever came back from Chicago and said, you know, wow, I love Chicago. They had a Kohl's and an Applebee's and a Lowe's all on the same corner. They talk about the funky cafes. They talk about the live music. They talk about the shopping, the walking around. They talk about the things that make a city unique, that you know you're in Chicago. Even down in Tucson, you walk 4th Avenue, you walk the neighborhoods by the University of Arizona, and you know that you're in Tucson, Arizona. And we just don't have that same feeling here. Even as recently as six years ago, when I first moved to Tempe, I could walk down Mill and know that I was on Mill Avenue, which I'd been hearing about forever. Um, I grew up in Tucson, and everyone always talked about how cool Mill was, how much fun it was to come up here. Um, now, when I walk around the neighborhood that I used to live in, it just feels completely different. These gigantic green and orange, like Art Deco, Miami-looking condos, row houses. Row houses have never been a part of Arizona architecture. It's just so artificial. Even the Mill, which is what Mill Avenue is named after the flour mill is being turned into a shopping center. Someone had an idea that they might like to turn the top of the silo into like a five-star restaurant. The real estate investment trusts and those kinds of developers came to Tempe because they were paid to do so. Incentives actually have warped the market so that our downtown turned from the mom and pop businesses that were here to those corporate, large corporate organizations. They, they lose the roots, they lose the roots. Yes, they do. And they're nothing without roots. with Mill Avenue, and it happens in other cities, is cities compete among cities, and they have to compete globally. So they're caught in a catch-22 so that, so that they can still attract business. If you want your community to be vibrant, and you want your community to be healthy, then you must support your independent businesses, because supporting chains, they will come in, and if they don't do the dollars that they have been, you know, told that they need to do, they are out of there. By eliminating the incentives, we are also eliminating the attractiveness for those kinds of businesses that were looking for the guaranteed income stream that came from corporate guarantees of leases and government guarantees of property tax and sales tax abatements. By eliminating those kinds of things, we're opening the gates to see the return of small businesses, and in fact, that's starting to happen. When Borders moves in to downtown Tempe, 
They don't have lawyers in town. They don't have accountants in town. They don't have carpenters in town. Everything is shipped in to them. Uh, there's a study that's just released in San Francisco last week. Um, for $100 spent in a local business, $42 remains in the community. For $100 spent in a national chain, the same $100, only $13 comes back to the state. The rest of it goes to pay distant shareholders. and So then when you multiply out those dollars that we're spending our money for them to come here and export our wealth, we're allowing our city councils to rob our communities of dollars. So the dollars go right out of the community. They don't stay in there to pay for schools and police and fire departments and the arts programs. Voting with my pocketbook is the best thing that I can possibly do for my community. You can go to Borders anywhere. They're all over the place, but why Mill Avenue? I think that's sad because there was only one Mill Avenue. Regardless of the clubs or venues, it was the people that came there because of what was there. Hey, look at that great Borders. Hey, look at my big fat Greek restaurant. And it's not about whining and it's not about making people feel guilty. It's really about just teaching them about what it means to have independent stores in their community and what independent stores like ours give back to their community, which is way beyond just having good books. The corporate attitude has made it sort of like going to a mall. It's just like being at a mall. And the attitude down there is like a little too uptight for me. No one wanted Mill Avenue to end up like a mall. Our economic future depended on our ability to be, to distinguish ourselves from a shopping mall. The only economic model that our city council seem to understand is one based on shopping. We don't have to put all our eggs in one basket. There can be several things going on simultaneously. Why can't we have great shopping, but also have a really vibrant music community? I mean, Austin's done it. It's a perfect example. They are recognized in one world for one thing and in another world for another thing. It, it does have a lot of independent business. Uh, it's outside, it has trees, it has diversity. Uh, not as much as some people would like to see. Great cities are diverse, and great cities are not always sterile, and they're certainly not homogenized. And so when it becomes too corporate, too new, too clean, um, you've lost the diversity that you needed to have a great city in the first place. That's not to say that uh, there isn't a concern that we are becoming mall-like. Uh, and uh, we need to be vigilant to not let that happen. Ultimately, you can't outmall the malls, especially when it's too hot out and um, you have to pay to park. Absolutely nothing is wrong with malls. Malls are a great experience for a whole lot of people. My point is that mall shoppers aren't drawn to pedestrian-friendly outdoor areas. To people who are brought up in suburban America who are used to malls, Mill Avenue can be downright scary. Um, you may get a lot of people talking to you or talking at you or walking by you. The kinds of characters that, uh, that you find out on the street here uh, add to the interest of this area and uh, add to create a certain tension on the street, which I think is a good thing. I think that's what, what one of the reasons people come down here. Given that, there's a lot of people who love that environment, so why would you not build on the strengths of what you have? Believe it or not, even, even some of the prime developers are, are very interested in, in retaining uh, the diverse feel that, that is out on the street. I really think that there, so much goes on so fast that by the time you put that, that a person in a corporate office decides to be artistic about something and you finally get it there, it's steps that, there's so many steps that move beyond it. How creative can you be when that buildings have to have uh, certain heights and, and, and you got a code on how they want to, this easement needs to be there, you got to be 100 feet from this. Who makes up this stuff? Way to that way to da 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 Everybody wants them to look and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I don't go to the only bar down, down on that street where anybody's going to see any bands anymore is a dueling piano bar. Yeah. That kind of, that really kind of epitomizes the, the whole, the collapse, if you will, of, of what happened on that. Like, what, like little time I was able to, to have there, 
like was taken from me for reasons I can't really explain. I wouldn't call it corporatization. I mean, that's also unfortunate too. I mean, who wants to go anywhere and see like anything turned into something you can go anywhere else, but it seems to be the cycle. It happens everywhere you go. And of course we're gonna all be nostalgic and, and would love to see things the way they were, but that's progress, or is it? Everything that's cool turns into something that's not cool, and then something new cool happens, and that turns into something not cool, and then that, you know. So, unfortunately, I don't know who to blame. I, I don't really think it's something we should like hold on to, like struggling or like flailing or drowning. I blame the city itself more than I blame Starbucks or the Gap. Let me, let, me say, let me just say this about Starbucks, okay? If we have to say something about Starbucks. There was a time when that was probably a mom and pop store. It's like, you get an idea, it goes big, and then all of a sudden everybody hates you because you're so big. Borders keeps coming out. Yeah. It is not Borders' fault that they sell books. It's not Borders' fault that we're not playing in long longs right now. This is a generic brand. This is Walt Richardson's coffee. Walt Bucks. <laughs> Bring your bucks to Walt. <laughs> I'll treat you right, you know. we we'll say, hey, you executives, come on, have a seat. Let's talk. I'll give you a cup on the house right there. We'll talk. <laughs> Next time you all get ready to change the city, you know. Talk to me. I got some good ideas. <laughs> the majority of the decision makers, including the city council and the planners and the developers, uh, have a large stake in retaining that level of, of diversity and I think ultimately uh, bringing back the kind of uh, liveliness that, that was down here in the, um, in the 90s when, when, the, when the live music scene was around. The, one of the ways it gets reversed is for individuals to understand that they have power and, and stand up and say, hey look, we don't like the way this looks we need to we, we want to do something else with this damn it just get off the couch who am i i'm record store lady and i can call and meet with the mayors of five cities in the next week if that's what i need to do if everybody acts like it's okay then you know they think they're doing a good job and and i'm not saying it's wrong and i'm not i don't want to down anybody but i'm just trying to say that not everybody's happy with the layout. I don't understand this whole attitude of great cities are made by somewhere, someone else, you know, that, oh, I just want to move into a great city. Everybody who lives there had to make that city great. Everyone believes that brand new things are better than stuff that's already been here and that we just need to pave over something once again and start over and that's a fresh start and a better start. And I just think that's wrong. They're doing this as a game. For what and to what end? And does it help us? Are they making a better community out of it? Or is it just helping themselves once again to a capitalist pot? When Mill Avenue turned to become an entertainment retail district, that trend really starting in the, the early 1990s, uh, it lost the supports for those local businesses. The residential element of the support for downtown dissipated. And we're trying to bring that back and having some success doing that. We're going more vertical to focus on bringing as many residents into the downtown as possible. And that's why that's one of the reasons you're starting to see uh, condo towers popping up all over the place. What happens when these buildings go up and no one, you know, decides to move in? I mean, this is this is money, you know, against people pretty much. Divergent backgrounds get together to s remind people that this is not just, you know, one particular group of people and one particular income level that's, uh, you know, concerned about these things. Rather than continue the trend toward large retail developers in downtown, we've looked for residential developers who will come to downtown. And
was sad seeing that Wong's getting demoed. It was. And yeah. playing that last gig there. That was sad to watch uh, Long Wong's go down the night. The, the, they had a big closing ceremony and man, everybody showed up and it was a lot of music and it was fun. I walk past it now and it's just, there's, it feels like a hole, you know. I mean, they set the standard, Long Long's did, and it's absolutely get total credit for that. And fucking this, the, the dirty, the fucking, just fucking break, spit, <laughs> go fucking mad. That's what we wanted, and that's what they brought. So I moved to Tempe, Arizona to play rock music and to go to school, and uh, I was 20 years old and I wasn't old enough to, to go to bars yet. There was a little club there on the right called Long Long's, and the, the doors were open. You know, anybody of any age could stand there and just listen to music. And uh, I walked by and I saw this guy in a cowboy hat playing guitar. And he was shaking his head about as fast as I'd ever seen anyone shake their head back and forth, playing with his band, and that turned out to be Dead High Workshop. I was seeing these bands, Dead High Workshop, the Gin Blossoms, and I thought they were sort of, you know, something that by rights every 21-year-old kid should have in their college town. I think William Faulkner said that the key with art is to... Is to that which did not exist before, and that's what makes art unique, and that's what makes things unique. You know, Mill Avenue, you know, made some bad decisions and 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 wound up building on what was unique and and, and trading on it, you know, far too much. They seem to have lost what was unique about them. They they lost sight of of those things that were special, of the long longs, of the dead hot workshop, of the changing hand bookstore. This thing that that, that was once special becomes not so special at all. Dead Hot Workshop put it perfectly, or Brent put it perfectly when he said in their song, Can't Tell, it looked like your one in a million thing turned out to be more like one in ten. Living in the city, I've been getting out of touch. Stuck out on the treadmill, I've been running around too much. Thinking about the money, pollution, and the crime. Seeing what my neighbors got, comparing it with mine. Wonder why so many people see so black and white. They think their world's so special, only their way can be right. They don't like other people who are not the same as them. I thank it for fear and ignorance, and it's just the way it's been. Sarah Cena and I'm standing on the former spot of Long Wong's on Mill Avenue. I started working at Long Wong's in 1990. Bartender, waitress, manager, booking. Our landlord, Tempe Mill LLC, they were based in uh, Las Vegas. His original plan was to tear the building down and build a new and then have us and you know Cafe Boa come back in and then you know, wh whoever else. Well, that didn't happen. I'm not really sure what happened on his end. Um, well, it's, that's a little bit confusing. Uh, why he, and I think he was having trouble with the city, had found out that the wrecking ball had come. So, I don't, I, I really don't know. That's the story, you know. I went to Long Wong's, the parking lot that is now Long Wong's, and I went, to where I surmised was where the back door was, the stage door, and I took one step onto that dirt and I got a chill, I swear I did. But, uh, basically, we could have been here the entire time. If had we had known that he wasn't gonna tear the building down anytime soon, we would have, we would just have stayed. It was so freaky to know that all this music and everything that I admired from 2,000 miles away. Jim Blossoms, Peacemakers, Stephen Ashbrook, Pistoleros, Ghetto Cowgirl. All the blood and sweat that is on that soil now can be dozed away because somebody wants to put a car park or a mortar. Long Longs itself um, was more than just a live music venue. 
a restaurant, a bar, a place to hang out. People had been coming here for over 20 years. Everyone that came to Long Wong's had a, their own special attachment to it. And it wasn't necessarily just the music, but just the location. And I think the fact that it was a little, you know, little tiny eyesore in the midst of everything, but people, all walks of life felt comfortable going in there. Students, hippies, corporate lawyers, whatever. It was just kind of like a equalizer. It was just special. You know, because it was one of the last places in the midst of all the new. I miss it. Because every city needs music. I'm not sure that we would have been successful coming back into the new, more expensive building. I miss my Mill Avenue. That's all. We had a small period of time, just a few months, where we were going to close. And my employees knew we were closing, and they still didn't look for other jobs. They stayed. They wanted to stay. They wanted to be there till the end. And all of my bands wanted to play and didn't ask about money, didn't ask about where they'd be in the lineup. Um, and then, you know, 2,000 people came. It was, a, it was a good memorial, you know, for the end of that era. What do you miss the most about Long Long's being gone? Everything. <laughs>
it got taken over by Abercrombie and Gap. Yeah. <laughs>